Okay, so we're all gonna die, and we don't like that fact, and we're trying to think about what we should do about it. Uh, there are lots of ways that we might respond, everything from the idea that, you know, we should just accept the fact that death will render our lives meaningless, and that just sort of is what it is, and we should accept it, uh, to Epicurus's notion that this isn't really anything to be worried about. Epicurus said that where we are, death is not, and where death is, we are not, so why should we be worried about death? Death isn't here where we are. Uh, but at a certain level, responses like that don't seem particularly welcoming or comforting or anything like that. And it seems like the reason these responses aren't very comforting is because really what we're looking for in our lives is some kind of objective meaning, something where we will be able to say, it doesn't matter what happens to us, it doesn't matter what anyone else believes, my life has meaning. And if it is the fact that our lives will be rendered meaningless by our deaths, we face this really important, really difficult tension. This is a tension that some philosophers have embraced uh, through a school called absurdism, where they say, we want something on one hand, we want the fact that our lives need to be objectively meaningful, and on the other hand, we have the simple fact that our lives are not objectively meaningful. Our lives will lose all their meaning when we die, and that's just the deal. And these two things are in tension, and we can't actually give either one of them up. We can't give up a fact about the universe, and there's just something about us that makes it the case that we want a really meaningful life. We want an objectively meaningful life. And so we live this life that is absurd, where these two contradictory notions are sort of at play at the same time. And you might wonder how we should address this absurdity. Now, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard had a really interesting answer to this question. On the one hand, Kierkegaard thought that we really did inescapably crave meaning in our lives. He thought we wanted something called eternal happiness. And on the other hand, Kierkegaard thought that really if you look at the evidence, there's no reason to think anything's going to happen other than we are going to die and that will be the end of us, and that will render our existence meaningless. Kierkegaard thought that there was no way that we could actually prove that life has any sort of objective meaning, and that had to do with some things that Kierkegaard thought about how we actually experienced the world. Kierkegaard thought that if there was some sort of eternal happiness, if there was some sort of objective meaning in our lives, that was going to be some sort of objective fact about the world. But Kierkegaard also thought that if you think about how we actually experience the world, we experience the world not directly, but through our senses. We see the world, we hear the world, we taste the world, so on and so forth. We never actually directly experience the world. We experience the world subjectively. And what that means is we can never actually encounter objective truth. And so Kierkegaard thought that if there is meaning in our lives, if there is objective meaning in our lives, that is going to be an objective truth that we can never actually experience and that we will never actually be able to find any sort of evidence for. Now, as a philosopher, this response is really, really fascinating to me because as a philosopher, when we think about things that we ought to believe, we think about something called justified belief which is the idea that you should have good evidence for your belief. You shouldn't believe things unless you have evidence that makes your belief likely to be true. And philosophers think that most of the time, if not all of the time, if you're going to believe something, you need to have that evidence. You need to have justified belief in order to have a responsible belief. And this is where Kierkegaard's idea about eternal happiness really becomes fascinating for me. Because if you think about this idea that we can never actually experience objective truths about the world because we are what Kierkegaard called subjective creatures, that means that we can never have evidence for any objective value in our own lives. And if we can never have any evidence for the objective value of our own lives, we can never have the justified belief that our lives are objectively valuable. Remember, Kierkegaard said that he thought that the evidence showed that our lives probably were not valuable, that we died, that probably would be the end of us. And if you were sort of regular, everyday, run-of-the-mill philosopher, you would say, well, that's where the story stops. I don't have any evidence, and so I shouldn't believe it. It would be irresponsible of me to believe it. But Kierkegaard actually disagrees. Kierkegaard says that we should believe in something 
despite the evidence, despite the fact that our evidence tells us that it is probably not true. And the reason that we should do that is because that's the only way that we can achieve happiness and meaning in our own lives. In other words, Kierkegaard is saying that if you want to live a meaningful life, you are going to have to, at a certain level, ignore the evidence that is in front of you and believe something that is contrary to the evidence. Though Kierkegaard never actually used this phrase in any of his writing, and he never used it in his own life, there's an idea that is closely associated with Kierkegaard's reasoning here and has been since tied to Kierkegaard's thinking called the leap of faith. Basically, Kierkegaard's idea boils down to this. He thinks that as humans, we are passionate creatures and we inescapably want meaning in our lives. Now, we can't use our reason, we can't use our intellect, we can't use our evidence to find this meaning because the meaning is going to be an objective truth about the world and we can't experience that truth subjectively. But we can use our passions, we can embrace our passions to discover subjective truths about the world. And Kierkegaard thinks that the most passionate thing we can do, the highest passion that we can sort of reveal in ourselves is to believe in something despite the evidence against us. We can take the leap of faith. Now, this carries with it a lot of risk. We might end up doing something like believing in something that ultimately is meaningless or actually is bad or is legitimately evil. For example, white supremacists have a deep abiding love of a racist ideology. Plenty of people have fallen in with cult figures. Nazis believe in a cause that is greater than themselves. Somehow Cleveland Browns fans exist. And if Kierkegaard is right, it seems like there's not really a good way that we can or maybe even should talk people out of those particular ideologies. But Kierkegaard thinks that's the risk that you take. You can't have faith without risk. And maybe you look for eternal happiness as Kierkegaard did through your faith tradition. Or maybe you devote yourself to a cause larger than yourself like ending poverty or world hunger or preserving democracy or whatever it is. And maybe it's the case that life really is meaningless and we'll never know that until we die and we stop existing and that's the end of us. I don't know. But the important thing is that we have to be willing to take that risk. We have to be willing to risk the idea, Kierkegaard thinks, that we might be wrong. In fact, Kierkegaard thinks this actually shows how important faith can be. As he said in a very famous passage from one of his works, faith sees best in the dark. But that's what makes it a leap of faith, Kierkegaard thinks. It's not a rational argument. And ultimately, whether or not you agree with Kierkegaard comes down to whether or not you are willing to take that leap. If you are like most philosophers in the world, you'll see an argument like Kierkegaard's and you will say, well, there's no justified reason for me to take this view, and so I'm not going to adopt it. But Kierkegaard says, the fact that there is no evidence for my view is not a drawback, it's actually sort of a feature of the view. And ultimately, whether or not you find that compelling, boils down to whether or not you are willing to take the leap of faith.